Welcome back everyone, Houston Math Prep here to go over solving non-homogeneous Cauchy-Euler equations. That's when our g of x on the right side is not equal to zero. We have some non-homogeneous equation. And remember, Cauchy-Euler equations, we have the power of x in the term matches the order of the derivatives. So we have an x squared y double prime, x y prime term, and just a y term in the second order Euler equations that we're going to do in this video. We are going to actually solve these equations using the variation of parameters method in this video, so make sure that you're familiar with the basic variation of parameters method to do so. The first thing you're going to do is solve your complementary function. You will solve the associated homogeneous equation, in other words, the left side equal to zero. That will give you your complementary function. In much the same way, when a was not equal to 1, when you did your variation of parameters method for constant coefficient equations, we will divide our equation by ax squared. In other words, to get our first term just to be a y double prime with nothing in front of it term. Once we've divided the equation through by ax squared, we'll then use our variation of parameters method. When we divide our equation through by ax squared, then that means our right side would then become g over ax squared, and you'll notice that when we solve our w1 and our w2, our Ronskians for our variation of parameters methods, you'll see columns replacing of 0 g over ax squared instead of just 0 g or 0 over g divided by a. We're going to work through two examples with you here in the video. We've got our first one here, x squared y double prime minus 2xy prime minus 4y equals 1 over x. So this is our g here. So we'll say a is 1 in this case, and b is negative 2, and c is negative 4. And we have our g is technically here 1 over x, so we'll be dividing by ax squared here in a little bit. Remember to solve our equation for m. Our equation for m with Euler equations is a m squared plus b minus a m plus c is equal to zero if we have a second order Euler equation. So our actual equation for m in this case is going to be m squared b minus a negative 2 minus 1 would give us minus 3m plus our c would be negative 4 here equal to zero if we factor this this actually factors as m minus 4 times m plus 1 is equal to 0. And so if we set both factors equal to 0 and solve for m, we'll get solutions for our equation for m being 4 and negative 1. So that tells us right away that our complementary function is going to be c1x to the 4 plus c2 times this power x to the negative 1. I'm going to write that as c2 x to the negative 1 just as over x. So this is our complementary function. And with variation of parameters method, just remember that our yp is going to equal u1y1 plus u2y2. We already have our y1 and our y2 here from our complementary function, so we'll need to go find u1 and u2. And the way we'll do this is with Ronskians. And now remember, before we start this method of variation of parameters, we want to go ahead and divide everything by ax squared. In this case, it would just be x squared. Really, the only thing that's going to matter when we're doing our Ronskians is the idea of making sure that g is divided by ax squared, right? So if we take our g and divide by ax squared, which would just be 1x squared, we actually get 1 over x divided by x squared, and that's actually going to give us 1 over x cubed, or if you want to think of that as x to the negative 3, x to the minus 3, you could do that. So when we're building our w1 and w2, we actually need to go off of this as our g over ax squared. Let's go ahead and compute our first Ronskian w. That's just based off of, remember, our complementary function here, x to the 4, and this was x to the minus 1. So building our determinant, we'll need the derivatives of those, which will be 4x cubed. And the derivative of this would be negative x to the negative 2. We go ahead and compute the determinant. x to the 4 times negative x to the negative 2. We'd get negative x squared minus this diagonal, which would be 4x squared. So we actually get negative 5 x squared for our w. We'll need to go ahead and compute w1 and w2. 
Now remember W1, we're going to replace the first column with 0 and this g over ax squared that we found. So we'll have 0 and x to the negative 3 here. Our original column 2 will stay, so we'll have x to the negative 1 and negative x to the negative 2. Doing our determinant here, this diagonal gives us 0 as a product minus, if we do this here, this times this would give us x to the negative 4. If you prefer to write that as negative 1 over x to the 4, you can certainly do that. Let's do the same thing for our w2. So w2, we're just now replacing the second column with 0 and that x to the negative 3. So we keep our original first column now, x to the 4 and 4x cubed. Doing our determinant here, this diagonal would give us x to the 1. Minus, when we multiply on that diagonal, we'll get 0, so we just get x here. And now we're starting to build our u1 and u2. Remember that u1 prime is w1 divided by w, and u2 prime is w2 divided by w. And for our first one here, w1 divided by w, so they're, they're both negative, so we get positive, and we would have 1 over x to the 4 divided by 5x squared, and that's going to give us 1 over 5x to the 6. Let's go ahead and compute our u2 prime. w2 divided by w, so here I have a positive divided by a negative, so we'll have a negative here. All right, so that'll be x divided by negative 5x squared, and that will just give us then negative 1 over 5x. All right, now remember those are our u1 prime and u2 prime. We actually need u1 and u2, so u1 is going to be the antiderivative of this, right? So that would be the antiderivative of 1 over 5x to the 6 dx. And u2 is going to be the antiderivative of negative 1 over 5x. Let's go ahead and maybe clean these up a bit. So you could certainly bump the 1 fifth out here if you want. If you would like to think of this as x to the negative 6, you could certainly do that. Over here you could bump out a negative 1 fifth. So you could say negative 1 fifth integral dx over x if you want. For this one here, the power rule, the power will go up by 1 and we'll divide by that new power. So we'll actually get x to the negative 5. And dividing by negative 5, joining that will actually give us negative 1 over 25 out front. Over here, this is just a log rule, so we actually get negative 1 fifth ln of x for this one. We've got our u1 and our u2, and so now we just need to remember how to write our particular function, right? So our particular function, remember, is u1y1 plus u2y2. And if you'll remember from our complementary function, our y1 was x to the 4, and our y2 was x to the minus 1, or 1 over x. So we'll go ahead and use all of this information, and we'll plug this in. So u1, y1, we'll get this negative 1 over 25, x to the minus 5, times y1, which is times x to the 4 plus u2, y2, so our u2 here is negative 1 fifth ln of x, and then we have times 1 over x, and if we go ahead and simplify this a bit, you'll notice that these powers will reduce here. We'll get negative 1 over 25, x to the minus 1, that's really like having x on the bottom here. We have minus here, and then we have this ln over x as well, so say ln of absolute value of x, if the 5 is on the bottom and the x is on the bottom, you might say 5x there. So this is our yp, our particular function. And now remember, our general solution will be the complementary function plus the particular function that we just got. So we'll have a solution of c1x to the 4 plus c2 over x, that was our complementary function from before we started doing variation of parameters, minus 1 over 25x minus ln of x over 5x. Now we want to check for any like terms that should be combined. 
This is an x to the 4 term, nothing in common with that. This is an ln x over x term, nothing in common with that either. If we see this here really as c2 times 1 over x, and we see this term here really as negative 1 over 25 times 1 over x, you can see that these are actually like terms. We have some multiple of 1 over x in both of these. So we have some constant multiple of 1 over x minus some more 1 over x's. That's really going to absorb that term into the c2 over x term. So really a cleaner way to write this solution the way we want to write this would be c1x to the 4 plus c2 over x, which is really a combination of this and this. You could write c3 there if you want. You certainly don't have to though. Minus our one-fifth or our ln x over 5x here. For our last example here, x squared y double prime minus 3xy prime plus 4y equal to x squared. In this case, if we're solving our homogeneous equation, then a is 1 and b is negative 3 and c is 4. And to solve our homogeneous equation, it's am squared plus b minus a times m plus c is equal to 0. So our equation for m here is going to be m squared. b minus a will be minus 4m plus c would be plus 4 equal to 0. This is factorable. This is m minus 2 times m minus 2, also known as m minus 2 quantity squared equal to zero. So if I just set one of these copies equal to zero, we'll get a solution for m of two, and because the factor happens twice, we'll get multiplicity two there. And if you remember from our introduction to homogeneous Cauchy-Euler equations, then our complementary function is going to be c1x squared. And to get linear independence for our other function in the fundamental set of solutions, we need to multiply by ln of x. So our c2 function is actually going to be ln of x times the x squared. Okay, we'll need to go about finding our y sub p. So remember y sub p is going to be u1 y1 plus u2 y2. And we'll start working on our u1 and u2 using the Ronskians. We already have y1 and y2. This is y1 here and this is y2 here. Those come from our complementary function and they are the basis for our first Ronskian, right? So we plug in those functions in the first row x squared and x squared ln of x. We find our derivatives for the second row. We'll get 2x. This is actually a product rule here. So we'll actually get 2x ln x plus x. And if we find the determinant for this, our first diagonal here, we'll get 2x cubed ln of x plus x cubed. That's our first diagonal. Minus this diagonal here gives us 2x cubed ln x. So doing the subtract here with those terms, we actually just get x cubed for this first Ronskian. Now remember, before we find our w1 and w2 in variation of parameters with these Euler equations, we want to divide everything through by whatever's multiplying y double prime. So dividing this entire equation by x squared, the part that we're really going to care about will be g over ax squared. That's what's going to go in our Ronskians. Well, since a is 1, this would just be g, which is x squared, divided by another x squared. We would get x squared over x squared, so that's just going to give us 1. And so just think that that tells us that the column that's going to go in our w1 and w2 is just going to be 0, 1. So let's go ahead and do our w1 and w2 now. So for our w1, we will replace our first column with 0, 1. And we'll leave our second column, x squared ln of x here. 2x ln x plus x. And if we do the determinant, we will get 0 for that diagonal, minus 1 times that top entry there, would just be the x squared ln absolute value of x. So we'll actually get negative x squared ln of x 
Our W2, the 0, 1 goes in for the second column now, so we have 0 and 1 here, and we keep our original first column of x squared and 2x. Doing our determinant, multiplying that diagonal will give us x squared minus the other diagonal, which would be minus 0. We get x squared for W2. And remember, we're trying to build our u1 and our u2, so u1 prime, remember, is w1 divided by w. So in this instance, we have negative x squared ln of x divided by x cubed, which would give us negative ln of x over x. Our u2 prime is w2 divided by w, and in this case that is x squared divided by x cubed, which just gives us then 1 over x. Those are the derivatives of u1 and u2, so we'll need to integrate. So u1 would then be the antiderivative of negative ln x over x dx, and u2 would be the antiderivative of 1 over x dx. This one over here we could do by u substitution. Just be careful not to confuse this u with u1. It has nothing to do with that. Just for integration, u could equal ln x, and then du would be 1 over x dx. And so then this integral here would become negative integral of u du, which would give us negative u squared over 2, also known as negative ln squared x over 2. For our u2 here, this one's pretty easy. I think we just get ln of x here. Remember, we leave off our constants of integration when finding u1 and u2. Let's go ahead and write our yp. So remember, yp is going to equal u1y1 plus u2y2. And so then our yp in this case is going to be our u1, I'll call it negative 1 half ln squared x times our y1, which was x squared, if you recall, from our complementary function, plus u2, y2, so our u2 over here is ln of x, times y2, if you remember from our complementary function, was x squared ln of x. And now what we want to do is notice that these are actually like terms. If you multiply here, we have x squared times ln squared of x. And over here we have x squared times, if you notice, this times this is ln squared of x. So we just need to combine like terms. How many of these do I have? What's the coefficient here? This is really like having a 1 in the front, right? So 1 of these minus a half of those, that's going to give us then 1 half of those, positive 1 half x squared ln squared of absolute value of x. And now if we go ahead and write our solution, which is our complementary function plus this particular function, so remember our complementary function to start with was c1x squared plus c2x squared ln of x. And now plus this particular function, so plus 1 half x squared ln squared absolute value of x. And you might notice that all of these are linearly independent. Nothing is a constant multiple of another, and so there's actually no combining of like terms or any simplifying to do there. We get c1x squared plus c2x squared ln x plus 1 half x squared ln squared of x. All right, hopefully these examples and explanations will help you solve your non-homogeneous Euler equations. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you in the next video.